I didn't wear my tie, but I wore my suit to, rep to show you that there are people that have lived and breathed in this um, conservative medical world who are shifting, and I appreciate <laughs> that. Um, the fortunate thing is all those letters after my name means my colleagues have to listen to me. Um, now, I work for a big corporate. Now, Sonic Healthcare is bigger than Qantas, Australian company, biggest pathology company in Australia, Germany, third largest in the US. So I'm also saying that corporates, the head of this company is a doctor, not an accountant. And this is where I work and we do 10,000 patients a day, two or 3,000 cholesterols, um, a few insulins, lots of A1Cs. And these are the tests that I want to describe to you today. Um, talk, and thanks to Rod, he's, he's sort of involved all of us in this. He's sort of created the network in Australia. We've got a lot to be thankful for. And uh, this was about a year ago. Um, I have gone low carb, high fat, and you can s you may be able to see that I've lost 10 <laughs> kilos. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, um, and I'm helping anyone who wants to understand blood tests and, um, and have contributed to that book. So obesity rising, you know, in 2008 we predicted that Australia will hit 63% obesity overweight. Last year we had the Australian survey, 63% in 2012. We're eight years ahead of schedule. <laughs> Here's some results of a woman who's overweight with diabetes and we're going to interpret her blood results. So her cholesterol level is okay. It's, well, so how do we judge the cholesterol level? 5.5. So about a third of Australians are over 5.5. So I get panicky calls from patients who've got a cholesterol of 5.8 and they think they're a genetic mutant of some kind and shouldn't be, belong on the planet. So 5.5 is a very steep cut, but it's not surprising if 60% are overweight and obese that every marker might be increased. And with the way we decided the 5.5 is, see this curve here, which describes how cholesterol is related to heart disease. Well, where does it start to rise? There's no point. You just pick a point. And it's a really an arbitrary um, definition. Another thing about cholesterol, people think cholesterol rises after a meal. No, it falls after a meal. So during the day, if you've had a meal, your cholesterol will be 0.1 to 0.2 lower. These are the cholesterol levels in uh, uh, men in Australia. And you can see from childhood, there's something happening in early adulthood which changes your lipid metabolism. And so middle-aged men, closer to 50% of them are over the 5.5 line. Um, Here's just showing that the fasting, which is the, op uh, the random, non-fasting of the open squares, and you can see that slight drop when you eat. It makes hardly any difference. For women, it's different. Their cholesterol start to rise postmenopausally. That's when they're putting on weight. This is the cholesterol in children. And in girls and boys, it's much the same until you hit puberty. And then boys' cholesterol levels drop. People don't know any of this stuff. Here's um, HDL, the good cholesterol. So what happens at puberty? Well, it doesn't really change in girls. But in boys, it drops. It's not that oestrogen increases your HDL, it's that boyhood and testosterone drops your good cholesterol. And there are a whole lot of other things that change at puberty with gender, like the high urate, and according to um, Richard Johnson, that would mean men are more susceptible to sugars and carbs and, and weight gain, because they have a high urate as soon as they're men. And bilirubin is another thing, which is another antioxidant in blood, which changes. Now, there are huge metabolic differences between boys and girls, and, and I think that the diet world is only starting to understand that. Okay, so cholesterol 5.2, 
the doctor's not worried. Triglyceride, 1.8, the doctor's not worried either. It's less than two. How do we judge that too? Well, it's about 20% of Australians, 20% of boy, uh, men, 10% of women above two. Um, if you choose a better cutoff, which is 1.5, it's more like 30%, like cholesterol. How do we judge what's a safe level of triglyceride? Well, where do you draw? Where is it that it increases? It increases all the way. There's no sudden point at which triglycerides are dangerous. Now, triglycerides do change after a meal. They'll increase on an average by 0.5 to 1.0. So the only reason we fast is for the triglyceride level. And here's triglycerides in men rising by middle age, in women rising after the menopause. So hopefully there aren't too many doctors that stop at cholesterol and triglyceride because they're 30 years out of date. Now most doctors think they're really clever because they know about bad cholesterol and good cholesterol. And we know that if the bad cholesterol, I'll describe this soon, rises, then you have more heart disease. And if the good cholesterol falls, then you have increasing heart disease. If you've got both, you're in big trouble. So what about this woman, 5.2, 1.8? Her HDL is 1. And most reports in Australia would say that's OK for a woman. Well, what's good? You can see that very few women are under one. But remember, women are supposed to be a bit higher than men. It's unusual for a woman to be below 1.3. So if we use the proper cutoff, which is 1.3 for women and 1.0 for men, the numbers start to balance up and reflect the fact that obesity is common in the whole population. Now these are the particles, when we're measuring all these tests, we're trying to understand these blood particles because one of them in particular is what causes heart disease. So at the beginning, when you're absorbing fat from the gut, you're making this chylomicron particle. It's full of fat. That's why we don't measure triglycerides after a meal because there's chylomicrons there. It takes, like glycogen, about 10 hours to get rid of, get rid of those out of the blood. And then once the... Uh, bodies taken up, including the liver, it will export that fat to the body. And as it exports it in this particle, the VLDL particle, gradually as you remove the triglyceride, you end up with this particle, which is the LDL particle. And it's got cholesterol in it. And it's left in the blood to transport cholesterol to our body. We need cholesterol for the membranes, for hormones, for, for many things. So. LDL, if you don't have LDL, you'd be very sick. And there are patients with a lack of LDL, they're very sick. So you need LDL, it's a natural thing. And then HDL, if the cell doesn't need that cholesterol anymore, HDL will take it back to the liver. So when we fast, we get rid of the chylomicrons and we get rid of this transition of moving triglycerides around with VLDL. And we've got those three particles, HDL, VLDL and LDL. Um, we know in VLDL it's mainly triglycerides, two, twice as much triglyceride as cholesterol. So when we measure triglyceride, we can divide it by two and we know how much VLDL cholesterol there is. Um, so we've got that covered. We can measure HDL directly. It's a fairly easy one to measure. Um, no, labor no routine laboratory measures LDL. We try to work it out from the other numbers. And so this is the formula we use, that the total cholesterol, which we measure, is the um, LDL plus the HDL and the VLDL. So the way we work it out is, by difference, the LDL is the total cholesterol minus HDL minus triglycerides divided by two. That's the formula used in all of your reports for LDL. And so for our example of that woman, she had a total cholesterol of five. We take about away the one of HDL. Her trigs were... 1.8, that divided by 2.2 is 0.8, 5.2 minus 1 minus 0.8 is 3.4. Sorry. Okay, so LDL, what are LDL levels like? The cutoff recommended is 3.5, 30% of the Australian population have an LDL above 
We've just created that number so that we could flag 30% of the population because we know it sort of fits with the fact that 20% of them are obese and 40% are overweight. They must, they're in danger. And this is the tool we, find, we use to find them. And to be honest, as a pathologist in the lab, it's frustrating because I'm often saying to the doctor, are you really trying to work out this patient's... Don't you have a set of scales in your office? <laughs> <laughs> Um, anyway, so LDL good, HDL bad. Most doctors are really proud they know that. They're only 20 years out of date. So, and I'm going to illustrate this with this. So this ratio, the bad to the good, in this woman is 3.4 and it should be under 3.5 and it looks fine. But if you do her total cholesterol HDL ratio, which is below 4.5, it's 5.2 and there's something wrong. Suddenly there's something wrong. And to be honest, the New Zealanders have been trying to teach the Australians about total cholesterol HDL ratio for the last 10 years, and our National Heart Foundation is resistant to the power of this ratio. Now, why is that ratio useful? So the ratios we can test out, a little bit of mathematics, but it, you don't need to understand the mechanism. If we divide all those terms by HDL, then mathematically they equate. So the total cholesterol HDL ratio is the LDL HDL ratio plus that plus that. Now what are they? So the total cholesterol HDL ratio is HDL over HDL is 1. So this is always higher by 1. It's the LDL plus this. Remember VLDL is the trig divided by 2.2 and HDL? So the difference between this ratio is a constant of 1 and that term, which is triglycerides over HDL, that's what gives the total cholesterol HDL ratio its power in predicting heart disease. So that's the relationship. So the, the, the higher triglycerides, the more they deviate from the other ratio. And here's an example of this. The two, two groups of patients who have the same LDL to HDL ratio, if they have a higher triglyceride, it's disastrous. So the LDL-HDL ratio is insensitive to the effect of triglycerides on heart disease. Now, we're starting to get somewhere. So the total ratio is better. Why? Because it reflects high trigs and low HDL. When do we get high trigs and low HDL? In obesity, diabetes and metabolic syndrome. This ratio is a marker for the metabolic syndrome. I mean, you should just use the straight marker, total triglycerides over HDL. If that's the one that's giving all the power, why don't you use that in the first place? OK, so here's some diabetics, and you can see low HDL, much higher, and, and um, low, uh, high triglycerides. So we've got in these guidelines that, you know, women should have a... HDL above 1.3, men above 1.5, and for the markers in the definition of prediabetes, using cutoffs of 1.5 or 1.7 for triglyceride, not two. Okay, so so this woman, if we interpreted her results correctly, we would have looking at that triglyceride, saying it's a one above 1.5. That's the end of the story. She's in danger. We don't need any ratios, and that's the modern way to interpret um, lipids. Now, just um, finishing off this issue, when you make triglyceride, it changes HDL. Anybody who has high triglycerides will lose their HDL. Anybody who has high triglycerides will change the nature of their LDL. By, by swapping fats in and out of LDL, they make it small and dense. High triglycerides predict low HDL. High triglycerides predict small, dense LDL. It's all to do with high triglycerides. I'm waiting to get my triglycerides. I haven't tested them. They used to be about four. And I, I might let somebody know what they are after uh, 10 kilograms of weight loss. Anyway, so triglycerides is the key. You should almost forget about cholesterol. And this small dense LDL is also oxidizable and, and glycatable and it changes. As soon as you change LDL slightly, the liver doesn't want a bar of it. 
and it has to end up somewhere and it, and it basically ends up in your blood vessels. Okay, now just quickly on sugars, uh, what happens to uh, glucose when you eat it? 80% goes to muscle, that's where most, and particularly in men, have got lots of glycogen. But for, um, and a little bit goes to the liver. But fructose cannot get into any other organ in the body other than the liver. And in the liver, it can break it down to pyruvate and stop. You can burn it, you can make sh glucose out of it. And so in this experiment, if you give fructose, you can make glucose, a three-carbon glucose, because you have to break it in half and join it together again. But if you give fructose with glucose, it sort of makes sense. Why would you bother making glucose if you're already taking the fructose with glucose? We've already got it in, we're storing it. The body stops making, converting the fructose to glucose or burning it when you take it with glucose. And it's really insulin that switches this across from conversion and metabolism to making fructose into fat. And when you feed animals fat or people fat, it goes up. Now, I'll get to the uh, end of this uh, punchline. So, now, haemoglobin A1c is the, is the redness in your blood and glucose, the sticky stuff that, you know, when you eat it, it sticks to, it sticks to everything, it sticks to the redness in your blood. And we can measure how much glucose is stuck on the haemoglobin to say how high have your glucose levels been over the last few months. And this is, um, we can use the haemoglobin A1c just as we can use the glucose to say when is a patient in danger of having the disease of diabetes. So a glucose level of, fasting glucose level of around 7 or a haemoglobin A1c of 6.5% is now a definition of diabetes. But, but look at all of this. What happened, what's been happening back here? Nothing. So you're perfectly safe until you get to di the diabetic stage? No. At an A1C of 5.5%, your risk of cardiovascular disease is starting to climb exponentially. And at a level of 5.5 or so, your triglycerides are rising and your HDL is falling, i.e. you've got small dense LDL, you're, you're filling your blood vessels with cholesterol. And so here's the small LDL particles which can't find their way to the liver in the blood vessel wall. Now one thing that our next speaker will be talking about is these insulin levels. These are two patients with identical glucose levels but completely different insulin levels. They are not the same patient. The fact that your glucose might be normal means nothing unless you, you know what's going on in the background to do that. And this is haemoglobin A1c. These figures um, I haven't published, but I might end up publishing with the next, next speaker. This is haemoglobin A1c against insulin. I guarantee you won't find it anywhere in the literature. So fasting insulin rises with A1c almost linearly. Two-hour insulin, just two seconds. <laughs> One and two-hour insulin, Notice how it doesn't keep rising. It rises and then falls. Two-hour insulin rises, then falls. And C-peptide, which is sort of like an average of all of those, it rises, then falls. So, really, haemoglobin A1c tells us about this pre-diabetic state, the one with high triglycerides, low HDL, and hyperinsulinemia. And this is the phase that people are dying of heart disease. Certainly, if you get diabetes, it'll be worse. So, in conclusion, sugar creates fat, the fat makes small dense LDL, and that causes heart disease. Haemoglobin A1c reflects glucose, and, and before you become diabetic, the haemoglobin A1c does tell you about insulin resistance. So, in answer to the question of the audience, if you wanted to work out your insulin resistant, and uh, somebody showed an A1c before, the reference range is not 6, it's closer to 5.5. So congratulations, Troy, you're still healthy. <laughs> but 5.5 uh, and above means you're on the way. Thanks. <laughs>